thanks thanks for coming on. So should we go ahead and start? Yeah, let's let's go ahead. All right. Well, tell us a little about uh, introduce. Please introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your organization and uh, what you're passionate about. We'll go from there. Sure. Um, so my name is Amit Mehta, as it's listed on the, I guess the left hand the left hand side of me. Um, I'm the head of innovation for a corporation called North American Lighting. It's a fully owned subsidiary of the Coito Group. So basically the head of innovation for the entire corporation. Um, we're the leading tier one supplier of exterior automotive lighting. And what that means is we have around 23 to 24% market share worldwide. So one out of every four to five cars that you see on the road, that's us. Wow. That is, yeah. that's great. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, it took a long time to get here, but just to give you a little backstory of exactly how we got here, the company itself, Koido, is over 100 years old. It's based in Japan. It is 20% owned by Toyota, um, and we Toyota is our largest customer. Um, what we've done in the past is kind of bring the visibility and safety aspect of lighting into vehicles. So as you know, 20, 30 years ago, the, the vehicle didn't really have an identity. It was just lighting was used at night to provide visibility and safety. Then all of a sudden in 2000s, in the mid 2000s, we reached the LED state. And what the styling uh, designers from OEMs really figured out is that they could use lighting to develop a brand image for the vehicles. So they created this lighting uh, image and the ROI for the OEM was incredible. So from that point on, they decided that we're going to offer different tiers of lighting. So halogen, HID, which is high intensity discharge, which is now no longer here. LEDs, which everyone knows what they are. And even now that we're using lasers. And lasers, you got lasers on cars. Wow. There are no lasers. I'll, I'll, I'll explain a couple of those. Um, not Just reminds the... me of that, that quote from uh, <laughs> what of that movie, sharks with lasers on them, right? Now we have cars with lasers. On them. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah. So we've used laser, we've used LEDs to kind of brand the vehicle image. You can tell if a Lexus is coming down the street, you can tell if a BMW, uh, a Porsche, et cetera. Then recently we decided not us, but the lighting industry in general decided, Hey, let's test out lasers. What's the benefit of laser? A laser can really go out to 600 meters for a very short, narrow line with spot visibility. And what that means is if you're in the hills of Europe, driving around in Switzerland, this vehicle will allow you to see 600 meters ahead of you. And that's a huge improvement. Wow, that's uh, phenomenal. I would, that's love I would love that. Right, it's not available in the United States yet. Uh, so because of the, I mean, I think it is starting to come in, but it hasn't, the adoption rate hasn't picked up because it's just for high beam. So it's not really that necessary. Um, so to give you, that's kind of a back history of what we've seen. Um, also to show how much LEDs mean to the industry, our revenue in 2012 was $4 billion. So it took a hundred years to get from zero to 4 billion. Our revenue in 2018 was 8 billion. So Holy cow, that's amazing. Years, yeah, just on LEDs. And when you look at a component complexity of a headlight 20 years ago, it was only 15 components. Today on some, some headlights, you'll find 200 components. Insane. Yeah. That's insane. Is it because, so, is it because of the, that? Is it like, what is it that it precipitated this huge jump? Is it the LED technology or what is it in particular? Yeah, it was the LED technology. It was, wow. We, so when you use a bulb and you put it into a reflector, as was done in the past 20 years ago, you need that area that's around the bulb to radiate heat, right? Otherwise, the heat will melt something if you're too close to the reflector. What the LEDs did is they took radiation because there's three types of heat dissipation, radiation, convection, and conduction. They took the radiation and they moved it over to conduction. So in that sense, you had the LEDs that are now attached to he giant heat sinks. Heat sinks are aluminum cooling mechanisms, basically, that the LEDs are attached on top of. So the heat is now sent to the back instead of the front. Now you have all this extra space that you can use to style the vehicle and put the LEDs in a certain array. I mean, from LEDs, the LEDs that I've seen, they seem to have, don't they seem to not have much to them at all they're just very tiny and they have they don't have much to them to be able to allow them to provide the same level of lighting as as everything else it's like are you saying in the automobile ones there much there's like a lot of back end electronics that are required to keep it 
there's is a it, lot is it the of brightness back-end. or that's right yeah there's a lot of back end electronics uh, there's a lot of cooling a lot of fans um, and also if you think about some of the LEDs the lumen output of an LED so the amount of light that it's it's re- 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 allowing to be absorbed into the world is around 2000 lumens for a low beam by the time it gets to the lens it's only 800 lumens 1200 hmm. lumens are lost in heat uh, in other absorptions of the lenses through through the air. So basically, these LEDs have to be very powerful. That's interesting because I, I thought these things were like miracle lights. They, they, they didn't have <laughs> all of those all of those like heat requirements or anything like that. I didn't realize the LEDs put off any heat at all. I thought they yeah. put off like zero heat. A lot of heat, a lot of heat. Really? So these operate, a low beam operates at typically 22 to 23 watts. Um, but back in the day, the halogen ones were operating at 55 watts. So double. Oh, those halogens are ridiculous. ridiculous. <laughs> I mean, I'm surprised that we're still using them, but <laughs> I have them. I have them. I have some of that lighting in my home, right? Still. Yeah. 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 Um, so yeah, just to continue on from that, then in 2016, what really happened was GM General Motors made an investment into cruise automation, and that was a one billion dollar investment. Now Tesla had been along uh, around for a little while before that. And they were trying to get some traction in terms of autonomous driving, electric vehicles. They hadn't picked up that much as they have now. But when OEMs, original equipment manufacturers, such as the major companies, Ford, Toyota, Honda, they saw this investment that GM made. They said, wow, there's technology in the Bay Area and we need to be a part of that. So every single company decided that they need to open operation here. And the reason was, they could see that we are changing the vehicle from a product to a solution. Right. Right. And in 2017, that's when our, my company, Coyo, made the decision that we need to be here as well. And in that decision, I was transferred from Michigan to the Bay Area uh, to kind of lead this autonomous driving or mobility s- sector. And what we've done is kind of understand what our assets are, which is lighting. And what can we provide inside the lighting for the future for our customers and the the general consumers? And that includes LiDAR, radar, camera. Those are the three sensors, three major sensors that will be required for autonomous driving and for ADAS uh, in the future. So level two plus driving as well. So you provide those sensors as well, not just just lighting. So you've gone beyond just the lighting piece of it. So that was our next step. So when we got here, we knew nobody, we knew nothing. Um, nobody knew what NAL or who NAL was. Nobody knew who Coito was either. So the first thing I had to do was brand. So I started a meetup. Um, I started speaking at CES, different conferences, kind of understanding who the startups are out there that can support us. Two, a year ago, we finally found a startup that really fit our mission and vision. And that startup was Septon. They're a LiDAR-based company out of San Jose. So we funded their Series C for $50 million. Um, and that is a uh, company that we're working with to kind of deliver a sensor as a tier one integrator to an OEM. So do you, do you deliver it as Tesla now or is, are, are you going to the other manufacturers or do they do it themselves? Uh, so Tesla is against LiDAR. Um, <laughs> that's the only company that's actually... Why is that? Why, why are they not interested in LiDAR? Uh, well, Elon has come out and said it's a, it's a fool's rush, fool's gold is LiDAR. Um, They were interested in LiDAR six, seven years ago when they first started testing it. Uh, At that point, they decided that they can do everything with camera and radar. Um, And it's it's entirely up to them. I don't know if they can or not. I wouldn't bet against Elon, but I don't know if he's right on this one. But isn't it, isn't, I mean, I've heard LiDAR is better than, better than cameras and radar, right? I mean, it's, it's, I mean, I don't know that much about the technology, but Mm -hmm. I'm assuming that it is better. So it's not necessarily better. Cam- so camera gives you uh, better visibility, of course. It gives you an image, right? Sure. Um, radar, what radar does, it gives you uh, the location of an object, the velocity of an object. And the, they're starting to come out with high definition radar. This has the ability to give you uh, a high density point cloud. It's not there yet. Now where LiDAR really succeed in all of this, succeeds in all of this is nighttime driving. Mm-hmm. So camera needs light to see. Absolutely. So it has a very low visibility after 80 meters if you don't have the right high beams or low beams and 120 for high beam. 
radar, of course, they can tell you that 300 meters out that that's a cat. Um, if it was a high definition radar, but today it can't, sorry, it cannot tell you that. Um, but it can tell you if there's an object there, you don't know what object is there. So you just realize there's an object. Whereas LIDAR is very good at night. It doesn't mm -hmm. need a, because it, it usually operates at 905, 940 or 1550 nanometer wavelength. It doesn't need the light spectrum to be applied so it can actually gather data from, from a certain object. Interesting. So, but, but is there, does it break down in the daytime though? Or is, is no, it, is no, it less so there is, precise? That's a very good question. So there is interference on the 905 and 950 um, or 940 spectrum, but that's, that's kind of being solved in the 1550 nanometer spectrum. I mean, I, I could go deep into that, but I don't think, I don't know if you want to go, <laughs> to go really deep into the technology. So have you had, so have you had, so you, you've had a lot of success in bringing these products into major corpus. They've had no, you've had no issues with them pushing back and going, these things are too advanced. Uh, we don't want to work on them. It's, 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 it's really the other way around. They're, they're eager to start working with this kind of stuff. Is that right? I think they're, e so yeah, they're, they're eager. We haven't had success yet We're, we will have success. We see the first success coming in 23, 24, um, because you know, automotive life cycles are usually five to seven years. So by the time we got here, 17 to 23, that's seven years. So we're pretty, that's a pretty successful timeline for us. The way it really started was, and this is a kind of a 2018 report from BCG. There are eight profit pools for automotive. There's the four standard profit pools, which is regular car sales. There's aftermarket, there's financing, um, and there's another one. In that section, the total profit pool for 2020, 2017 was $226 billion worldwide. Now, what we're seeing is due to these new emerging profit pools, these include battery electric vehicles, these include fuel cell vehicles, these include on-demand mobility, data and connectivity in 2035 the total profit pool will be 370 billion dollars so 150 billion more than it is today but those are not coming from your legacy components they're coming from these new data and connectivity areas but to get the data and connectivity you have to offer your consumer more than he has today and one of those areas is allowing the consumer not to drive so I think in the future, what's going to happen is you're going to have two, maybe three vehicles and one you can possibly use as your own personal Uber that picks up people in the, in your, in your neighborhood. And to do this, you need the required sensors to make it work because you're taking the brain, your brain power and transferring it to the vehicle. So we have, we have the eyes to see what's oncoming. We can hear, we need all of that to a certain extent, 99, 99.9%, .9%, somewhere there to operate on a vehicle as well. And that's what we're providing. We're, we want to provide those sensors as the first step or the foundation to move to adding software, adding intelligence, and then making these profit pools come to life. Well, see, the thing I'm wondering about is that why aren't we there yet? I mean, is, is the technology actually at a point where we can say that the sensors and the work is sophisticated enough for us to have truly autonomous vehicles, or there's enough sensing going on that we can have truly autonomous vehicles, or are we still far behind? Like if you took a, uh, uh, if you took the latest and greatest technology in all of this stuff and put it on a vehicle, it might make it, you know, might make the vehicle worth $2 million, but would it be able to be a perfectly safe autonomous vehicle? Are we there yet? If you're going to say $2 million, yes, we, we could potentially, <laughs> yes. We could Not something I could have in my driveway though, right? Yeah, <laughs> right. We could potentially do that, but think of a vehicle as a 16 year old, right? Right. A 16 year old takes 16 years to learn how to drive. Um, and you want this vehicle to learn instantly to go from point A to point B. Yeah, but it, it already knows how to drive because it, it's driven before, right? I mean, it's just right. a copy of another car. <laughs> it's just a copy and a copy and a copy. But there's a lot of new edge cases that come in play. There's abilities for us to, let's say you're at a four-way stop sign. Um, how do you know that the person has acknowledged that you go first or the other person should go first? And there's yep. the frame trolley problem. So the frame trolley problem is that you are traveling in an autonomous vehicle and either you hit a trolley in front of you and potentially cause the deaths of many people, or you have the ability to turn slightly to the right and cause the death of another person that's in, on the right-hand side. 
Um, and if you think about it, we today worldwide, I think there's about 1.3 million traffic fatalities, at least reported. And that's basically the frame tra trolley problem, right? Either you're going to kill 1.3 million people or you're going to kill some amount of less people. But a robot killing a person is not the same as a person killing a person. So we as people would not forgive a robot for killing even one person. There right. was the but Uber driver. Right? Would, you, would you charge the programmer? That's the question. That's that's the big <laughs> I love, question. I love you... the way philosophy is getting getting pulled into this because it's great. We need to talk. We need to see. I always think 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 that we should have chief philosophy officers at every company so they can get yeah. into the 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 deep ethics of these situations because that's what's going to happen. I think that's might might even be one of the things that are holding us back. It's like, oh, you know, it's obvious. You know, we don't want to just uh, knock over this bus or this trolley, and we want to, but it's 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 less obvious than that. But it's funny how we can we can point fingers at a human being and say, oh, you made a mistake when you did this instead of that. Right, but right. when it comes to a piece of software, we're like, what do we do? We, yeah. we, we just step back and go, well, we, we, we don't know this yet. We don't know exactly what we're going to do yet. It's that's a black box to us. Yeah. yeah. But it needs to have, I think that's the thing with AI is that you really need to have um, uh, visibility or transparency, right? You need to know yeah. why did it make this decision? Like, did yeah. it, like, what did it weigh to make this decision? Because we do that instantly, right? When we're, we're faced with these scenarios, we have to decide, am I going to do this? Am I going to do that? What am I going to do? Right? right. And right. Right. We have humans a can make brain. mistakes right. just we as well. <laughs> right. Of course, we always make mistakes. But then you put it back to our deep conscious. That's where we start making mistakes because we start overthinking certain areas, right? And that's, that's the car is going to have abilities like that, too. We need the right infrastructure. We're not there in the infrastructure section either. Um, especially in the United States, China is already actually providing um, autonomous free rides in certain geofence locations. So they're far ahead of us at this point. And Joe Biden has announced that he's going to invest a lot of money uh, somewhere. I think it was a total package of two trillion, but three hundred eighty-five billion would be towards infrastructure. So that's that's exciting to see. Well, here's my question to you. I mean, if you add infrastructure around the autonomous vehicles, that makes it a little easier for the autonomous vehicles to operate. But I'm assuming that we want autonomous vehicles to be able to just operate in the real world as just as it is and not change the environment. Is that is that where the thinking is? So that's that's uh, Tesla's thinking. So right. that's where Tesla comes in and says, OK, we're just going to use camera and radar and our supercomputer, which is apparently the fifth best supercomputer in the world right now. Uh, has the ability to provide this information in real time, like we would, right? But the way the OEMs operate is a little different. They're very long validation and qualification cycles. Um, and their vi vision is vision zero. So vision zero, it's not okay for them just to release a vehicle to be autonomous. And they need to make sure the environment around it is also communicating with the vehicle to provide uh, exponential safety. Right, but the problem is, is then you need the environment to be there before the vehicle can enter right. the environment. That's right, you do. Right, and then yeah. you're depending on lots of other things in the environment to to be in place. So, I mean, isn't Tesla's vision a little more realistic? Or um, I don't, it depends how you would imagine to be realistic, right? It's we we know where we want to go from point A to point B. We have the infrastructure already developed. If I wanted to come visit you, I'm sure I press on Google Maps. This is where I want to go. And the entire economy and ecosystem will benefit from, or the GDP will benefit from having autonomous driving and ADAS solutions available for the public. And that being said, I'd rather be very safe than have a kangaroo jump out in front of my vehicle and the car not recognize it in North America and say, whoa, what's that? Right. Or a bus that's slightly in a different angle or profile that a camera has never recognized before and then just keep going and cause a crash. So for me, I think infrastructure is very important in order for this to all work. That's that's really interesting. So I'm a big proponent of autonomous driving because I'm on the roads every day and I can't imagine I can't believe how horrible drivers are and they're getting worse. Yeah. They're getting worse. <laughs> so I think we're stuck in this weird period where we don't want to make the leap into autonomous driving because there's going to be other humans on the road. But right. if we leapt fully into autonomous driving, then I think we'd be we'd be golden because if we if we turned it all over to computers, they'd right. be able to figure it out 
better yeah. than we would be able to. It's the mix of human and computer that is causing the problem. Yeah. Um, and you think about past when we had horses and the human, right? Um, the human driving the vehicle and on these unpaved roads and you'd have horses right next to it. How did you make the decision that, okay, horses are no longer allowed on this road? And it'll come to that point where the government will have to make a decision. Human driven vehicles are not allowed on the road anymore. Or, or specific roads. You could say, okay, if on this specific stretch roads. of freeway, you know, you've got to be in autonomous mode. Otherwise we won't let you on it. Right. And then yeah. suddenly magically fatalities will drop to zero. Yes. <laughs> like, wouldn't everybody exactly. be happy about that? But then, exactly, you, know, yeah. you still have those rebels in their, in their uh, older Mustangs going, oh, no, I'm never going to give it up. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> That's funny. Cause when Porsche came out with the SUV, a lot of Porsche guys said, Hey, we're not going to buy your car anymore because this is for Porsche enthusiasts. But they said, Hey, we're making more money off of SUV. So too bad, but that didn't erode there. Yeah, exactly. Oh, so <laughs> yeah. So do you see, it's interesting what you said earlier about, um, you said people are going to have three cars. I think you didn't finish your thought there. What was the, what was the other two cars that people? Yeah. Have? So I would say two or three cars, but sometimes you have, uh, you're going to need a car that you want. A lot of people are saying we won't need cars anymore right? Because everything will be autonomous. But I think there's going to be age ranges or demographics that prefer to have their own car because you might have a child or someone to pick up from soccer practice or transport some stuff. Um, so that car will always remain there. And then the third car could potentially, for the, at least in our lifetime, could potentially just be a not autonomous based car, just an ADAS solution where you've just kept for a long time. And then all of a sudden you want to continue to improve the engine or add like you would remodel a house, you remodel your car in that yep. case. Well, the other thing I'm thinking is that because of what's happening with tech is that don't we have to continuously trade in our cars? Like, Have we basically rung the death knell for long-term ownership of automobiles? So um, the general lifetime of a vehicle right now on the road is 11.7 years. And uh, what we're seeing now is the utilization is somewhere around 4%. Um, but when we move to electric vehicles, that is really low. I just have to say <laughs> that's just really ridiculously low. low. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, you, you're sitting here right now, your cars, I mean, you probably barely drive it. I mean, you said you're on the road a lot, but if you take out the whole week, well, you know, a lot, change. I think what's happening is it, it's kind of like one of those things where, you know, when you're near empty, you notice the needle on your <laughs> gas more. Yeah. Right. It's like the more when you're when you're out, I probably you're probably right. I probably only drive my car four percent of the time, but in that four percent, I get so much <laughs> aggravation out of the other drivers. It just right. feels like lore. <laughs> right? No, I can I can believe that. I can believe that. Um, yeah. So that, what I'm what would happen is you're moving now to electric vehicles. So the components inside an ICE usually would break down eleven seven point seven years, but when you move to electric vehicle, you basically just have a battery. And right. there's a lot, there's an OEM right now in China who's experimenting with battery swaps, who's Neo, where you would drive to a certain station instead of filling up your battery, you just swap out a battery and keep going. It takes 10 minutes. Well, that makes more sense, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, the, right. having to sit there for all this time waiting for it to recharge. That's right. I mean, yeah. <laughs> but then all you sense. need is a battery, battery pack. It's, it's like getting a propane for your tank for your barbecue. It's like so swap this in and out. That's exactly that. right. Yeah, you nailed it. <laughs> yep, that's exactly right. And when you go from uh, conventional vehicles today, like I see internal combustion engines to the electric vehicles, your entire engine's gone. Now you have a frunk instead of an engine, right? And all your, your only moving parts or your wearable parts are your brakes and your tires. Mm -hmm. So now the lifetime of your vehicle will increase substantially. And what this has, what they're saying is by 2030, 18% of the vehicles on the road will be electric. Well, that's great if you can upgrade your car like over the air or something like that, yeah. or the hardware itself doesn't necessarily need to be upgraded. I mean, because that's what happens with regular vehicles today, right? It's kind of yeah. like the car I bought back in 2015 is very different from the car I bought in 2020. It is very different from the car I bought in 2024. Right. But there has to be a point, and I don't know if Tesla is there yet right now, where the hardware is pretty much set. And then yeah. all you need to do is continually improve the software. Yeah. But I have a feeling that because you know a car is not a mechanical thing, it does need to be upgraded hardware-wise. I think over time. Or are you are you saying to me that no, it doesn't need to be because the electric motors are pretty much set. 
So Tesla is what they've said is they're there. I, I saw a tweet a couple of weeks ago that said we will have all the hardware ready for FSD, full self-driving on our cars in the next year. Mm -hmm. um, but the software will upgrade. So exactly what you're saying. Uh, so I think, I think what you're saying is our OEMs kind of in trouble because you're going to need to provide customers with this basically basic platform, like our phone, and you just upgrade through software. Right. Yeah. And that's the same question for your phone. You likely replace your phone every two or three years. Why yep. you have everything right now. I think my phone's awesome, but in two or three years, I don't. Yep. And why is this? Cause the cameras got better because the software that's in the, on the chipset got better. It, it's going to be the same way that we should look at it. Yeah, no, that's what I've always, I've said that for, for a couple of years now is that our car is basically a consumer electronic, yep. right? So we should treat our cars in the same way we treat our phones. So th every three or four years, we just buy a new one because the tech has been upgraded. But like you're saying at a certain point, the tech can be upgraded. Well, I guess you, you're always going to, the Tesla is never going to be a forever car, right? You're yeah. going to have it for a longer period, maybe, but there's right. still be, you know, better brakes, better, better this, better that some, there'll be some better hardware that will yeah. make you say, Oh, I'm going to have to get to the next model. Right. Exactly. That's exactly right, because, what's going to happen in the future. I mean, Tesla themselves, they want to sell more cars, right? So yeah. you know, if I already yeah. have one, I want to sell another one. I don't want it to be forever. We're going to get into this. Oh, we don't want this thing to last forever because I want to sell more cars. Right. right. Exactly. Exactly. So tell me a little bit about, um, so the lighting specifically. So, I mean, I, I agree with you 100%. So there's lots of really cool stuff happening design wise. And I love seeing this kind of creativity when it comes to, uh, the way cars are being redesigned due to the size of the lighting and stuff like that. Because there, there were a lot of restrictions before, right? I mean, your your headlights had to be a certain size, your your taillights had to be a certain size, and now it, they've gone wild, right? And not only they, not only do they use it for utility, it's also for style. That's right. And I mean, how far do you see that that going? I mean, what else can they do with it? So it's going to go very far. So the, what we're looking at now is, um, I don't know if you've seen the new vehicle that came out, the Lucid. It's a Lucid Air vehicle. It just came out. I haven't seen it yet. No, not, okay. not in person, but I've seen it online. <laughs> okay, yeah. It's an amazing vehicle. And if you've seen it online, you've seen that in the front, they have this grill that kind of lights up uh, and very thin profile lighting that's kind of hidden, only, only actuates when it's uh, on. So you can only see that area when it's actuated. Um, so lighting is going to start playing more of a role in the grill. And why, why the grill and why will it start taking up that bumper space and the rear space? The real reason is communication. Um, we're going to need to communicate to other drivers or even pedestrians, if you're an Uber driver, a Lyft driver, or, or just a regular driver, what the intention of a car is uh, in a very basic and binary way. So your reptilian brain can act, actuate or respond to something. Yeah, because like that's it. what happens after a while. It, it, it just becomes totally unconscious because you can yeah. see the, you know, the hood of the car dipping and stuff like that. But Sorry, go on. I didn't mean to. Oh, yeah, so, yeah, so that's, that's what we're going to see. We're going to see this lighting kind of take over that space and provide communication. And what Koido is already working on is these items we're calling corner modules. So we're going to replace the entire uh, headlight and add this corner module. And what this corner module does, it has the lighting functions, it has the sensors integrated into it, and it has the cleaning functions to, to provide um, cleaning for all the sensors that are inside the lamp. And also on the front, it has communication. So if one of the biggest things that happens in Japan or one of the ways that accidents happen is in Japan on, on intersections in cities, there's a very high wall. And as soon as you cross that sidewalk, you can't see the pedestrian and a car usually hits that person. Not usually, but that is an accident that happens. So that kind of communication to let others know that a person is approaching and kind of flashes from that light through the through the uh, intersection. So we have traffic lights that communicate with pedestrians that communicate with vehicles to track where that person is going and then provide that information to the vehicle and the, and the pedestrian. So, so you're saying that the lighting will add a lot of functionality around this vehicle. So with the lighting, will the lighting be actual, we can actually be used for communication to other vehicles too. So the vehicles can talk to each other over the, over the light source. That's right. Oh, that's very cool. Yes, so, that, so there's Li-Fi as well. We're looking at um, Li-Fi. Yeah. This is new. I've never heard of that. What yeah, is we're that? Looking at Li-Fi. So Li-Fi. That was one example. Li-Fi is an example where you communicate 
lighting to lighting, just like you have Wi-Fi, lighting, lights and LEDs can also transmit data. So you can communicate from one point to the other using this light source and send packets of data to each other. Right now, it's a very, very small amount, but the bandwidth will increase in the future. So that basically the cars can communicate to them to each other over this. I mean, is it more is it more accurate than Wi-Fi? Like if, if we had Wi-Fi, if both machine both cars were Wi-Fi, could they communicate over Wi-Fi no. or Li-Fi? Or what was what would, would be the most effective way for them to communicate? It would, so 5G would be the most effective. But if 5G is unavailable, then you have an ability to have uh, Li-Fi or Bluetooth or some solution that's right next to each other to let them know there's a pothole ahead or not. You should swerve to the left or right, uh, that kind of situation. I love that. Um, I, I, I can't wait where, for that. <laughs> <laughs> another area where lighting is really taking, I think it's going to add a lot of value. It's not here yet, is in traffic lot, in traffic, uh, sorry, parking lots around the United States, there's around 1 million accidents that occur. So a kid will run behind someone that's just parked and this guy's pulling out and all of a sudden you might hit the, the pedestrian. What needs to be done with lighting is some high intensity uh, light that provides communication to let others know that this person is backing up and reversing. Sometimes you don't see the backup lights because it's on a certain plane, uh, but if you provide it on the a projection on the road surface, everyone can see that very easily. So we're working on those areas as well. Oh, I love the sound of that. I think that you're right. I mean, there's so much new new safety stuff, I guess you could say, that's in in cars today. I mean, I just bought a, a CX-5, and uh, yeah. it's so different from my 20, 2018. <laughs> this is just like three years yeah. ago. And it's got so much yeah. more safety tech than than even like three years ago. So I can imagine what else you could you could do. I mean, these things would be super safe I, I love it so um so it's time to it's time to think like a futurist it's 10 2031 so it's 10 years out where do you think right. the world the world will be in that space in 10 years so um are you saying specifically around mobility sure okay uh yeah so i think as i said 18 to 20 percent of vehicles on the road will start to be electric uh, right now it's about two percent i think we're going to see uh, um, although we live in the very, bay area so it's probably more like 18 percent around here right <laughs> yeah probably probably here already yeah <laughs> i guess we need to get it adopted in michigan yeah but, exactly um, <laughs> yeah uh we'll see a lot of uh the beginning of the l3 plus l4 entrance around that time meaning that well, the way we describe it is L2 is hands off, L3 is uh, eyes off, and L4 is mind off. So we're going to start to see those kind of creep their way into the into the streets. Um, I'm gonna, we're going to see a lot of new business models take place that we've never seen before. Uh, we're going to see the ability to, uh, if you get in the car and they know you like Domino's at 7 p.m. every day, they recommend automatically ordering it. Um, and then there's a revenue sharing between the OEM, Domino's, and the data provider. So this kind of activity will kind of take place over the next 10 years. Right now, we're going through a business model innovation because there's three types of innovation, product, process, and business model. We've done the product 10, 20 years ago. Um, at least for automotive, it's starting to come through with sensors. But in terms of business model innovation, that's going to be the biggest point of inflection over the next 10 years. Um, so I'm not, I'm not as excited to see what's going to be out there in terms of hardware I'm very, or software. I'm very excited to see how they become a viable business model because the technology is kind of here to make it happen, but it's just not available that we can actually monetize it. So it's beneficial for the corporations and tier ones out there. Yeah, because if you think about it, you're, you're basically creating a movable living space right mm -hmm. and in a, a, a movable living space where all of the occupants of this movable living space none of them need to be watching what they're doing right and because right now you yeah. have a driver and you have and you have passengers right and the passengers can do whatever they want but the driver always has to be keeping an eye on what, um, what's going on but if you That's think right. about a moving 
an autonomous moving space. I mean, people could live in that. You could you could rent it out. There, it could be right. uh, temporary office space. There's just so many business models around this this moving space. Right. Moving space, it's just incredible. And yeah, there's just tons of stuff. And if you think about it, I mean, it could interact with the environment. Like you say, it could it could you know look at who's in the car. I mean, one of the things I was thinking about is like, for example, look at Uber today, Uber Pool. You put four or five people into an autonomous vehicle and move them from point A to point B. What if you could actually do something more useful with the kinds of people that you had in there? Maybe it's people who want, want to meet each other. Maybe it's like a dating app or something like that. You can, <laughs> yeah. there's, there's so many. Right. Uh, yeah, I think you're right. I think the business model innovation is the real exciting stuff because you can see sort of the technological progression and yeah. autonomous vehicles are going to be table stakes at one point. And I wish it would happen sooner than than 10 years out that we get yeah. to 18%. Yeah. But <laughs> so you're saying 18% for electric vehicles. Is yeah, that right? Yes. Yeah. But autonomous vehicles, do you think autonomous vehicles will be that? Very small. How autonomous. prevalent will they be in 10 years? One or 2%. When you really? say autonomous, I'm saying level four and above. One right. One or 2% at this point. Yeah. One, th one thing that might not be a popular opinion, but one thing I'm worried about or thinking about is real estate prices. Mm. Um, if you're having this hybrid working situation where you just work two days a week at the office and you have an autonomous vehicle, at least on the highway, do you really care if you live an hour away from work? Why not two hours? Why not three hours? Right? Yeah. It, it doesn't yeah. really matter anymore. So Well, I, I'm 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 waiting for the days we have autonomous apartments, right? Where oh, you can actually okay. live. <laughs> yeah. Just think of it think of it an autonomous RV, right? So if you took yeah. an RV uh, that somebody is living in and you had it driving around it could take you to work it could take you to school it could take you wherever you want and then say we, you were actually at work it could you know rent itself out you know yeah. during the day so there's no reason why you know we can't get right. to that point but it just seems that all of this stuff is so far in the future that yeah. you know it'll take 20 30 years before we get to that point and i'm just like can we at least get autonomous vehicles <laughs> yeah <laughs> I mean, it's it's a very complicated process because now there's so many regulations to go through as well, right? It's not yeah. just the tech is here. If you just let us take the cars and put them on on the road, yeah, they'll crash into stuff here and there, but most of the time they'll do okay. Yeah, um, yeah. So it, it, it's it's us again, right? It's we're right, we're always right. holding ourselves back. It's right, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Right. Yeah. All right. Well, this is this has been great. Thank you so much. So if somebody yeah. wants to get in touch with you, what's the best way? Um, please just email me or go through LinkedIn. I'm always available on LinkedIn. Just search me up. My email is my first name, Amit, last name, Meta at uh, Amit underscore Meta at NAL.com. Um, I'm very excited to talk to anybody that's interested in this space and learn more. Sounds good. Thank you so much. And I'll put your contact information in the show notes if anybody wants to get in touch with you. That's great. Great. Thank you so All right. much. Thank that you, sir. Great. Talk Thanks. to you later. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.